To suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. How would it feel to set strong boundaries for yourself while simultaneously building close and healthy relationships? The secret to reaching this great place and developing an inner compass to guide you through difficult situations is being able to answer one simple question. What are my feelings trying to tell me? I'll repeat that. What are my feelings trying to tell me? It might be a simple question to ask, but it's a hard one to answer, especially when the message might be inconvenient or possibly frightening or brings up shame. My witness on The Meaningful Life today is Carla McLaren, who is an emotions and empathy expert and the author of the book The Language of Emotions, What Your Feelings Are Trying to Tell You, that has recently been revised and updated. So welcome, Carla. How did your childhood help you to be able to write this book? Well, thank you for asking. My childhood was a pretty tumultuous one and dangerous. In my early childhood, we we lived in a neighborhood where there was a child molester. And so that was sort of one of the realities of the neighborhood for the little girls. And for me, this started around three. And if you know child development, this is when children are developing their self-concept, they're developing language, they're developing their where they are in the gender continuum. So I learned a lot of really terrible things. Oh <laughs> a lot of really terrible things about what it was to be a female, to be the low person on a totem pole, you know, to not have power. And Another thing I learned was, and this is a part of my family's nature, they're all artists and writers. So I already had like a higher trait empathy. So what I did was I turned up my capacity for empathy and for figuring out what was going on in the social world with emotions and thoughts and intentions of others. And that was one of the ways I tried to make myself as safe as I could. But because I didn't know how I turned my empathy up, I never learned I didn't know how to turn it down. So for me, the world was overwhelming. It was emotionally volatile. Things were coming at me all the time. I didn't have a sense of boundaries. That's one of the things that gets taken away in, you know, abuse or in cultic relationships is the boundaries are the first things that go. So I was like a live wire or a burn victim with no skin, right? It was just an intense life. So for me, looking at the emotions wasn't sort of a, you know, I was holding a pipe and I was in a, uh, you know, in in an academic environment. For me, it was, I need to understand these to save my own life. And fortunately, jumping into the emotions in that way, in that kind of oceanic way, helped me understand them at a, a very deep level and understand that they were all there to try to help me that there weren't any worthless ones and all of them were going to help me get through this traumatized, boundaryless state that I had entered into. So from going from emotions are the worst thing in the world and I need to figure these dang things out to they are the center of my life and career and they are what healed me. So yay, (laughs) it was a good ending. (laughs) <laughs> it's a difficult choice, <laughs> being smothered <laughs> or sounding terrible. So, uh, yeah. But I think I would rather be able to speak properly to you. So, you started to learn to camouflage your emotions and to repress them as well. When, when did you do that? Well, I think most of us learn to repress our emotions just in the social world and in families. Our emotional training tends to be abysmal, abysmal. You can hear it in just normal, everyday parenting statements like, oh, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, right? And a child gets the picture right away that crying is not something that you want to give. Don't talk back to me, young lady, you know, 
So I get a picture that standing up for myself and expressing anger is also not welcome. And then I also get, there's that smile. There's that smile, which tells me my happiness and contentment. And those emotions are very welcome in the community, but pretty much nothing else is. And when you go to school, you also learn that any child who is feeling, you know, a heightened level of emotion is taken out of the class. And they go to the principal's office or to the school nurse. And all the children learn that it is not okay to have any outward experience of emotion. It's just not okay. Even in little ones who haven't yet figured out how emotions work, even in preschool and kindergarten where kids are still figuring out what emotions are, they're not welcome. So we have a huge societal burden on people's emotional lives. And I learned very quickly which emotions to hide, all children do, which emotions to pretend to have, which emotions to, you know, have privately. So yeah, our emotional kind of world of understanding is very disordered, very disorienting. And something that you started to do at a young age was you started to disassociate. So That was awesome. So tell me about <laughs> disassociation. <laughs> Now, that's another choice. Not everyone does it, but because I come from a family of very creative people and writers, I have a very vivid and kind of nourishing imagination. So while, you know, the terrible things were happening to my body, I left and I would float above what was happening and just not even be available to it to whatever extent I could. It was the only real power I had, right? It was the only real way to escape what was happening. And so hyper empathy, which I had turned on, and dissociation became my go-to skills. And because I didn't have a functional, you know, personal boundary or the ability to say no to what was happening, there's a huge swaths of my life that I don't remember. You know, people say, do you remember your second grade teacher? I got nothing for you. Nothing. So I spent a couple of decades very dissociated and without boundaries and with a very disturbed emotional system. So it was it was touch and go there. I think I had my first suicidal episode when I was 10. So I also grew up with the suicidal urge and with severe depression. So it was a lot. It was a lot. And uh, I have to say, I look back at the person I was then, I'm like, you go. <laughs> you were awesome. I don't know how you got through that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the emotions that finally got me through. So how did you get from where you were to actually writing a book, helping <laughs> us get in touch with our emotions? Because it <laughs> feels like you could possibly be the worst person in the world to write this book, or perhaps the very best. <laughs> so I didn't come at emotions in an intellectual or, or you know, merely intellectual or academic way. I came through the fire. Right. And sometimes I joke that the book should be called, I went to hell so you don't have to. <laughs> that is a great title for a book. <laughs> it's a great title. There you go. But my mom was a yoga teacher. So I spent, we spent some time in the kind of a alternative medicine, alternative spirituality world. And the things that I could experience, which was extreme hyper empathy, there was a place for that there. There was a name for it. It turned out to be a name that wasn't exactly true, which is I was an empath. But also there was a lot of work with grounding. You know, almost every meditative practice has you do some kind of a prayerful grounding. And I was able to find ways to get somewhere near, I, I, I got body adjacent, right? Somewhere near my body to be able to start feeling. It was a process of going from pretty much, you know, living somewhere to the left and above my body and to find ways to embody myself again. So I think that was a really important period of my life, but there's so much trouble in the alternative medicine, alternative spirituality world, and it can be rather predatory. So I spent time there and then left. Uh, my first books were, you know, about auras and chakras and all that ideology. But I began to understand that what I was a part of was damaging in and of itself. That world with no checks and balances whatsoever, no connection to research, 
was a sort of a, an open door to all kinds of chicanery and trouble. So I didn't want people like me to think that I was saying, hey, it's a great place. It was important at the time, but I needed to move on. So what was the ingredient that allowed you to go from this sort of very troubled place to somebody who could help other people with their emotions? I would say it was primarily the suicidal urge. Wow. Um, <laughs> which is an amazingly potent and powerful emotion that most of us have been taught to avoid at you know, all possible costs. But to start to meet it when I was 10 and grow up with it, I learned its ins and outs. I learned what it was for. And it can help you create a ceremonial death for that which is killing you already. Right. So it's, there's violence in it. And when we work in my current day work, which is called dynamic emotional integration, we tell people first rule is your body is off the table. When the suicidal urge arises, you will not hurt your body. This is the first rule. And what we do is take that, you know, incredible intensity of emotion and turn it out to what it has come to address. And if you ask your suicidal urge, what needs to end now? It will give you a list, right? And I was like, your body's off the table. Your body's not on this list. But it's like this relationship, this poverty, this despair, this loneliness, this inequality, right? It's an amazing emotion of self-actualization, which is a weird thing to say because you would think it was just an emotion of, you know, horror. So I think we need to understand what strong emotions are for. What I have found is that emotions arise to deal with whatever's going on already. And many people don't see them that way. They notice that when there's trouble, there's always one or two or seven emotions. So they, they attach the trouble to the emotions instead of understanding that the emotions came forward to deal with the trouble. So the more trouble I had in my life, the stronger my emotions were. And before I understood that, that they were there to help, I experienced emotions themselves as abusive, right? I was like, emotions are terrible. If I could just not have these emotions, my life would be perfect. And by incorrectly attributing the problem to my emotions, I was missing the entire story that was trying to come forward, right? And so now when I have a strong emotion, I don't say, you need to go have anger management training or something. I was like, whoa, okay, understanding what rage is about or anger is about, there's been a boundary crossed and I missed it. And now this emotion has come up at a, at a more intense, you know, whatever. Yeah. One of the problems is that we tend to divide emotions into good emotions and bad emotions, sort of mm -hmm. negative ones and positive ones. Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing I could change in this world, I think it would be this idea. What do you think? Yes, that's the first of my four keys to emotional genius is that there are no positive emotions and there are no negative emotions. Emotions are part of our basic capacity to make meaning and understand the world. And there's no bum ones. There's none that we shouldn't have. I think, as you may have seen, one of the problems with this bad idea is that people, when they know an emotion is supposedly negative, they will avoid it and pretend not to have it. So they don't develop any skills with it. How can you develop skills with something that you're told never to have or never to want? And on the converse side, People tend to stay in the emotions that they've identified as good or positive or pro-social, even when there's no reason to be there. So what happens with that good and bad mythology is that people don't develop skills in either type of emotion. What I've noticed is it tends to create an abusive relationship with emotions themselves. Certainly the ones that we try to push out of the house and pretend that we never saw them. And also the ones that we, we keep near us and we force to show up no matter what's going on. So I think certainly the so-called negative emotions get, you know, experience a lot of damage from that. But the positive emotions, they're kind of thrown out into the world like you know, badly cared for circus ponies and made to dance for the audience. 
I think, yeah, I agree with you. If we could, if we could remove one thing, it would be that valencing of emotions. Yeah, because anger, we've learned, even suicidal emotions yeah. can be good since yeah. they teach you an awful lot. You know, yeah. anger says something important. Yeah. Whereas things that we think of as good, like love, I mean, some terrible things could be done in the name of love, can't they? Yeah. Or the three pseudo positive emotions, happiness. If you stay in happiness for too long, that's called a toxic positivity bias. It's clear that you need other emotions and not just happiness or joy, which is sort of considered the queen of emotions can be a very dangerous state because it helps you drop your boundaries and a lot of your other emotions will move to the background. Getting people into that joy slash mania state is one of the tactics of cults. Love bombing and keeping people up all night and, you know, making them feel tremendous. It's one of the ways to strip people of their boundaries and attain control over them. So it's sort of like, what? Yeah, (laughs) there's problems. And I mean, the final problem is it's actually impossible to move all the positive feelings to one side, all the negative feelings to the other side and only live in the positive feelings. I mean, it's just actually impossible. Yeah. And I think we've all been in places, specifically workplaces, where you're not allowed to say anything negative, right? You know, don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions. And it has like this chilling silencing effect. You know, families can do this too, where people cannot notice what's wrong and the business will begin to implode because nobody can speak to what's real, only what's nice or up-tempo. I was brought up in a family where feelings were considered to be a problem, you know. (laughs) Oops. Funny how I ended up spending my whole life talking to people about emotions. (laughs) Isn't that funny? (laughs) So if we're going to have these emotions, we better learn how to channel them. Yeah. How to work with them instead of against them or for them. I mean, we've all seen people who, when they feel angry, they're just going to town, right? There's no pause. There's no awareness there. They're just taking the energy that anger brings them and going with it. And sometimes they're going at us. And so I think for a lot of us, you know, I was talking about the attribution that we make that's incorrect when we blame emotions for the problems, when it turns out they actually came to help with the problems. Another attribution that we make is when people are just terrible with their emotions, when they're just abusive or just awful with their emotions, we blame the emotions. Say, yeah, anger is a terrible emotion because we've seen so many people use it without any skills whatsoever. So poor anger, which has tremendously important work to do for us, you know, gets thrown out the window. (laughs) I'm never going to be angry because anger is, you know, evil. And what we were seeing is a person with no skills. So how do we work with our feelings in a respectful and honorable way, which is what you're trying to get us to do? <laughs> For me, the, the important thing is to know that the old idea of emotions, the old triune brain idea, which is where emotions are at the lowest level and they're primitive and uncontrollable. And then you've got this mammalian level and then you've got this, you know, neocognitive level or whatever. That's not true. That's not how the brain works. It's not how emotions work. Emotions are found throughout the brain and emotions and the supposedly logical or rational behaviors that we do, they are one and the same. They're a part of the same process. And so, Understanding that emotions are a crucial part of your basic everyday functioning and your capacity to make meaning, you wouldn't want to throw any of them away because you want to be as cognitively available to the world as possible in as skilled a way as you can. So understanding that emotions are not lower or primitive, I would say rather than primitive, they're ancient and they carry a tremendous well of ancient knowledge if we can connect to them. The second thing is learning what emotions do and why they arise. And I work with a model of 17 different emotions. I try to make it simpler by putting them in families, the anger family, the fear family, the sadness family, and the happiness family. And understanding if I'm feeling, for instance, anger, anger is the emotion of boundaries. 
it means that a boundary has been broken. If I'm feeling the emotion of sadness, sadness comes forward to help me let go of things that aren't working anyway, then I know it's time to look around and see what's not working anyway, right? So I take them as supportive things in my life. And, you know, I have to develop skills too, but they are, they're crucial to our capacity to basically do anything. So you're saying that emotions come in three nuances, soft, medium, and strong. Mm -hmm. How does that help us? It's so important, especially if you've got an emotion, as you're learning to work with your emotions, if you've got an emotion that on a scale of one to 10, you go to 11 with every single time, and what that means is you are missing the zero to 10 presentations of that emotion. I'm not saying that you should always be down below five or something with your emotional, because emotions need to arise at the level they arise. But you can get yourself into a habitual behavior with an emotion, such as anger, where everything makes you go to 11. Why I ought to, there should be a law, right? Your whole sort of organism knows how to work anger at 11. And so learning that anger exists in, it exists in the ones and the twos and the threes and the fours. If you can start to refocus yourself on the softer presentations of anger, and we do that through vocabulary, then you can begin to understand how anger works. Because when anger's at 11, you are sort of being taken on a ride with a very powerful emotion that you have literally no skills with. Right. So it's important to to get down in these lower numbers and understand that, okay, when this level of anger comes up, it means that a boundary has been broken. I need to reset it. When person when a person is in constant, constant high level anger, it means that their boundaries are destroyed. Something in their life is continually and regularly breaking boundaries. So that anger is true and it's necessary, but they need to develop skills around it. I think a problem that lots of people have is they don't realize that they're actually having multiple emotions at the same time. Yeah, yeah. You know, if if emotions are a part of cognition, you want as many of them as possible if you're working on difficult problems. But if you don't know what they are, you don't know what they do, you don't know how they work, it's just going to feel like overwhelm. You know, and you won't have that inner sense of understanding of what's going on. It will just sound like noise and static and if you don't know that that's how they work, then you could be very destabilized. Uh, one of the things people say anger is a secondhand emotion, which means they don't understand anger at all. Because let's say I feel sad and it's time for me to cry, but I know, you know, the intelligence inside me knows that I would lose face. Anger may come out in front and set a boundary. Anger sets a boundary. So if I'm afraid and I know that I would be seen as a coward, anger may come out. Right? Anger's doing what it does. It's not a secondhand emotion. It's trying to set a boundary. So just understanding that a lot of the ways that we've learned to approach and think about emotions are based on that terrible emotional education that we get as children. I tend to work with couples and mm -hmm. I often have one problem. And that is that one partner is trying to fight the flow of their emotions. They're trying to shut them down. Yeah. So they're repressing them. And the other one is doing unfiltered expression. So they just go, wah! <laughs> and they feel great afterwards because they've just unloaded everything. But the other person feels terrible. <laughs> and their partner says, well, I didn't really mean all of those things. You have to know that when I'm angry, I will say things I don't mean. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> this constant battle between one person is saying, let me have my emotions, and the other person is saying, you need to pull back your emotions. Yeah. And I would say, you know, we are a social species. And so one of the things that we do is we emotionally co-regulate each other. So if one person is repressing in an unstable co-regulation pair, the other person may go up to try to bring balance. But because most of us don't know how to work with intense emotions, we just become violent with them and abusive then all that's happening is the repressing person will be like, exactly, right? There, no, no learning will happen. And if the person does feel better after being abusive with their emotions, I'm going to challenge that. They shouldn't be feeling better for being abusive to anyone, right? So that would be that anger and shame are not working well together. Shame is the emotion that helps us uh, monitor our behavior. And anger is the emotion that helps us set boundaries. 
if our anger is actually breaking through our boundary and breaking into the boundary of another person, I'm going to be like, nope, mm -mm, that's not how we do that. So how do we find a sort of a middle way? If you are a couple who are in this situation, one person is holding back the feelings and the other person never holds back, how are they going to find a middle way? I think one of the most important and simple things to do is to together develop a more granular emotional vocabulary. That's what it's called in the research, emotional granularity. And I've got on my website a free emotion chart that we made for children and adults wanted it. So we made an adult version of the emotion chart. You basically go through his Monday, feeling anger, feeling this, and then using an emotional vocabulary list to see, am I feeling soft, medium, or intense anger, right? And begin to track your emotional lives and maybe even have a time frame. It could be that as you're repressing, I'm coming up, you know, like there's so much that goes in between us that we're not aware of. And emotions are such a, a crucial part of our capacity to, to exist in social groups. Yeah, that could be really interesting. You'd almost need an app. You'd almost need an app with two people on it where you're doing this and, you know, and then it could, it could see what's happening between the two of you, right? I mean, generally what I'm trying to do is get the person who's suppressing their emotions to come forward and say how they're feeling. Yeah. And I'm trying to get the other person who generally tends to be suppressing their emotions and then no longer suppressing them to also speak earlier as well. Yeah, to speak earlier in the, you know, traveling of the emotion, get it when it's soft and see what's happening and know what emotions do. I think for a lot of people, they have no idea what emotions do. And so they don't know what to do with them. That's why your question, what are those feelings trying to tell me, is so beautiful. Yeah, it certainly helped me. <laughs> so are there times when distraction or avoidance from our feelings is okay? Oh, yeah. As long as we know we're doing it. You know, like I will hit a really hairy problem that I just, I can't, I can't, right? It's just a lot. And I will, you know, write about it. I'll think about it. I'll feel about it. And then I'll be like, you know what? I want to go watch a drama on Netflix. And drama has a narrative flow in it, right? That goes, the emotion goes here and there. And then, so dramas for me as a writer are extremely healing forms of distraction. I don't do any kind of drugs or substances, but I would say understanding the distractions you tend toward and what those are bringing to you. Instead of just saying, oh, I'm a smoker, therefore I'm a failure. What does smoking bring to you? What does it bring to your organism? And then see if we don't like smoking, what else could you know do that? That sort of thing. But understanding what distractions you choose and what they're bringing to you is a way to sort of take it out of that kind of toxic you're a failure and look at what your organism is trying to achieve. So in a moment, we're going to look at a letter that's been sent by one of our listeners. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. How can I help you have a better relationship? There's nothing I like better than talking to some of the world's top sex and relationship experts. It helps me learn and grow. And that's why I started this podcast. But what makes my life meaningful is writing and teaching. That's why I've written 20 books on relationships, which have been translated into 20 languages. They fall into two categories. Firstly, improve your relationships. In this category, I'd like to recommend Happy Couple Handbook, powerful love hacks for a successful relationship. I cover constructive arguing, be a better listener, use carrots rather than sticks, and how to forgive and move on. In the second category, which is called Rescue Your Relationship, I have books like I Love You But I'm Not In Love With You, my international bestseller, Can We Start Again? 50 Questions to Fall Back In Love, my wife doesn't love me anymore, and my husband doesn't love me anymore, and he's texting someone else. 
You can find out more about these books, along with details about how to get involved with the show and send in your question to be discussed with my guests at my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com. Do unwanted, intrusive thoughts and urges interfere with your life? Are you exhausted from engaging in time-consuming rituals or actions? If you have OCD and are not happy with your current medication, there may be help. Now there's a clinical trial in your area investigating a new potential treatment for OCD. To find out more, visit OCDtrials.com and see if you qualify. Rockstar Energy Punch, bringing a bold and unapologetic flavor packed with energy through a blend of B vitamins, guarana extract, and 240 milligrams of caffeine to fuel what's next. Rockstar Energy Drink. If you'd like to get further involved in the program, that would be absolutely brilliant. And you can do that by going to my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts. There you can sign up for my Substack newsletter. I send uh, every two weeks an interesting article, something I've written about relationships, and there's all sorts of news about the meaningful life as well. And on the, exactly the same place, you can send in a letter. If you go right down on the website, you'll find participate in the program. And if you're going through a dilemma at the moment, you can send something to me to discuss with one of my experts. And this is the letter I've been sent this time. Last year, I discovered my husband has been having a two-year affair with a work colleague who was also a very good friend to me. I find it hard to put into words the feelings of devastation I felt and still feel. It physically hurts me so much, especially because during the affair period, we were in the process of adopting a child. The other woman was a very close friend and work colleague and knew things about our relationship which others didn't when we had a row, when things were tough, etc. Our children and hers were also close, and when we finally adopted our daughter, she even joined us on our first family holiday. Since the discovery, my husband has cut all contact with her, and we have read and used resources on the net to help us. He says he loves me and wants me more than anything. He made a stupid, stupid mistake, which then snowballed and he couldn't manage it. He was so scared she would reveal what happened if he finished it. We've worked hard and talked and listened to each other, but I struggle so much with the images and thoughts in my head of them being intimate with each other. I know I want to make our marriage and relationship work, he's my best friend, and I want to be with him. I just want to make these things go away. Thank you for your time. Well, all of them are here. (laughs) uh, I mean, I would also have to say this is so painful. This is such an incredibly painful thing to have happen. And I think one of the things that's missing here is an understanding of grief, that this level of betrayal means that the previous relationship isn't damaged. It's dead. It's dead. That betrayal killed all of the previous relationship. And so coming toward, you know, trying to fix it would mean we are creating an entirely new relationship because all of the agreements that we had in that previous one were destroyed. And I think that's hard because people sort of want to go to, I need to let this go. I need to let this go. As you know, if it's grief, you need a grief ritual. Another thing I'm seeing is for him to say this was a mistake. I think that's really dangerous because it wasn't a mistake, it was intentional. And if he's still seeing it as a mistake, she is unsafe because there's no way to know that he won't make this mistake again. So there's a lot going on here. Also that the families were close and this was a close friend. She's got a double betrayal and it is normal for her to be dealing with constant thoughts of the betrayal because it hasn't been addressed yet. Right. I would almost bring in this betrayal partner, but it means the families have been torn apart. It means the friendships with the children have been torn apart. It means the friendship with the woman has been torn apart. It means the trust, you know, there's so much going on here. And one of the things I would do is, is look at him that adopting a child is a huge thing, 
right? It's interesting that he split off from her as they were considering adopting a child. There's so much going on there that it sounds like he's not aware of that I would, yeah, he needs, they need to do some work on this. He needs to understand exactly why he did what he did. And that is how the relationship can go forward. It can't go forward with, I'm going to forgive you because no, that's not how we do that. That's not how we do that. Because if he has not shown that he can be a valuable and loyal relationship partner going forward, then her emotions are doing exactly what they need to do, which is continually reminding her of the betrayal. It hasn't ended. So you're saying that he shouldn't see what happened as a mistake. How no. should he see what happened? I mean, what was he doing? He was walking around in a field and all of a sudden his penis came out and just fell into a woman. This was an intentional behavior. This was an intentional choice that he made. And he should look at why he made that choice. He needs to do some emotional awareness work on himself as well. Not just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. If you don't know why you did it in the first place, you're not safe from yourself. You know, others aren't safe with you. I mean, I think this letter shows something you talk about in your book, the relationship between anger and forgiveness. Yeah. And I think a lot of us who've been injured are constantly pushed toward forgiveness. It's, it's, it's tedious, right? But because anger is about boundaries, you need to be angry as long as you need to be angry so that you can rebuild the boundaries. And forgiveness before you've rebuilt the boundaries is like hiring an attorney for the abuser. That's not what I want to be doing in my life. I'm not hiring you an attorney. You've already, you owe me money, right? But once I've rebuilt my boundaries, once I feel whole again, then from that place of wholeness, I can not forget not make excuses for, I can say, I can see that you're an injured and wounded person and you made decisions from that place. And I was injured and that's the truth of it. I think a lot of people want to forgive because they want to pretend they've never been injured, right? That they're somehow invulnerable. They're Superman. And that's not how life works. And I think there's a feeling of jealousy here as well. How do we work with jealousy? That jealousy is hugely important. Jealousy is the emotion that helps us retain mate value. When we get into relationships, it's the emotion that can help us say, how does that person treat their parents? How does that person talk about previous relationships? How does that person work with money? How does that person work with people who are less powerful than they are? How do they treat wait staff? How do they treat animals? How do they treat children? Jealousy, if we let it, would help us really get a huge picture of the person so that we would know exactly what we were getting into. But most of us go, you're beautiful. Let's have sex and move in together. <laughs> like We have no concept that we are getting into a really serious relationship where that person's weaknesses and behaviors and decisions could devastate our lives as this, this couple has just experienced, right? This is a devastating loss. Jealousy will come up and tell us when we are not the healthy focus of our mate and when our mate is being disloyal or unfair or not committed or not secure. And Jealousy is an incredibly important relationship, and it's interesting how often we've been told that it's evil, you know, like the green-eyed monster and stuff like that. I've never heard jealousy talked about as necessary, right? I mean, we know in sociology and anthropology the importance of jealousy, but in psychology, they tend not to understand it very well. But yeah, it's crucial. And the questions we have for jealousy is, what kinds of intimacy do I desire and want to offer? and what betrayals must be recognized and healed. So working with jealousy, you can really get into a relationship dynamic in a really healing way. There's another emotion that's here, and I wonder what that's for, and that's confusion. Confusion is an emotion that sort of covers over two other emotions. Fear, which is our awareness of the present moment. It's our intuition. It's our instincts. Right. And you can see confusion coming over because her intuition and instincts were really battered by this behavior from the husband. The other emotion is anxiety, which is our motivation and our capacity to move toward the future and finish our tasks and meet our deadlines. Right. 
And confusion will come down when there's too much input, when there's too many things to do, when there's too many decisions to make, right? As she's looking toward the future, she's got a couple of really painful decisions to make. Let it go and keep this person close to her because she says he's her best friend. And the relationship, which is terrifying, right? As it should be, because you've got children now, including the new adopted child. And you've lost one of your close friends and a family. You know, like there's so much loss here. So I think confusion would come and say, you're not ready to make these decisions. There's too much information you don't have. And confusion is another emotion that we are not allowed to have. And there's no positive talk about it. But what we're seeing in our community right now is that confusion is almost a meditative space if you can sit with it and know that you don't know and know that you cannot you cannot make decisions right now. It's not time. But a lot of us, when we feel confused, we're like, I need to make a decision. <laughs> I need to know. And sorry, you can't. And confusion is kind of like a reality check. Nope, it's not time. I often hear a sentence, you can learn nothing from happiness, contentment, and joy. Do you think that's true? No, no. They're marvelous emotions in their own way. And just like every other emotion, they have really specific gifts that they bring to you and really specific reasons that they arise. So I think you can learn a lot from these emotions. So I think we're beginning to run out of time. So (laughs) in a moment, we'll start moving into the bonus material. But before we do that, I have to say thank you for being a guest on The Meaningful Life and to ask you. you what makes your life meaningful. Love, research, I love research, laughter, and good stories, good drama, good books. <laughs> I'm afraid that's all we've got time for, unless you are a supporter of The Meaningful Life, when we'll be having the bonus material, and you can uh, find out details about that in a moment. What are we going to be talking about on the bonus material? We're going to be talking about conscious complaining and how it can help you heal. If you want to hear the bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. We're also available on Amazon Music. If you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life and unlock the bonus material this way, here come the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.